Hey guys, how's it going? Um, in today's lecture, uh, which is lecture 10 in, in unit 3 still, we are going to be focusing on uh, describing the effects of climate change and we are going to discuss the climate debate. Now, among scientists, especially credible scientists who don't use fraudulent data, climate change is not up for debate. We simply understand our place in our planet and how our actions um, have these environmental repercussions. And we understand, uh, you know, the biosphere. And um, yeah, it's really not up for debate. But I'm going to talk about the debate between scientists and people who might have their hand into big oil, for example. Um, so we will get into that um, in the end of this lecture. In the previous two lectures, we learned about how our ancestors um, manipulated Earth um, and Earth's environment on a global scale, right? Humans are extremely successful. So right from our evolution, uh, you know, the, our species, Homo sapiens, again, evolved 200,000 years ago. And even prior to that, the ancestors of... Uh, of Homo sapiens. Um, we have these different species that still had large brains like Neanderthal. They too were manipulating the planet on a global scale. Um, then we shifted into more modern times during the Anthropocene. We have, uh, you know, technological advances that allow the industrialization of cities. And it's these cities that pollute a significant uh, more amount, especially when it comes to greenhouse gases compared to uh, civilizations of the past. Um, so we're going to focus and we're going to learn about the effects of climate change um, more so today, but I touched on these, uh, these interactions in the previous lectures. Um, today, again, we're going to keep learning about the several, uh, these several effects of climate change mostly focus on how abiotic factors are shifting. Um, we will get into biotic factors later on in this semester. I'm gonna to touch on how abiotic alterations do shift biotic assemblages. Um, and then we will begin talking about this climate argument. So right off the bat, I keep saying climate change, even though the average temperature of our planet is warming, um, we want, I want you guys to use, and you know, scientists all agree that we should use the terminology climate change um, instead of global warming. So we use the term climate change because um, on average, yes, the planet is warming up. But if you zoom in on a more local scale, some positions of the planet are actually getting colder. Some positions on the planet are getting wetter. Some positions on the planet are getting drier. Some positions on the planet are getting warmer. So this um, term climate change, it will help more people understand their relationship with their environment. See, in a place that is actually getting colder, they're not going to believe scientists calling, you know, this huge alteration global warming because, hey, it's snowing here. It's really cold, right? So, um, yes, on average, the global temperature is increasing. That is without a doubt a fact. Um, we tend, we are using the term climate change. So I like this figure showing... Um, the darker regions in the uh, purples and the blacks and the dark reds, these are uh, positions on our planet that are drastically changing in temperature. So we can see here, um, so if, if the planet was, you know, in this figure, if the planet Earth was this color, then that would signify that the uh, climate is not changing, right? The temperature of our planet is not changing. The entire planet is, you know, 
most of it is in this red to dark red region, which shows that, um, and this is a model, this shows that the planet is going to be much hotter than it has been historically. So in the year 2090 to 2099, we are gonna see drastic uh, temperature fluxes. Obviously the planet is getting warmer. Again, this is uh, surface temperature projections. So another interesting thing to realize is that the Arctic, uh, especially the North Pole, is uh, drastically changing. And we see this today, right? The poles tend to change quite drastically um, when the global temperature changes. So this is definitely what we're seeing even to this day. And we'll get into that. I actually have a link that I want you to see. So climate change will cause changes in precipitation. So like that previous figure, um, a area that is white right here shows that these positions will actually stay the same. What you will notice is that there is not a lot of white area, right? You are either seeing more blues, which show a heavier precipitation and more tans, browns, uh, and dark browns, um, which shows less precipitation than previous years compiled. Um, so in the winter, actually, we are, um, our area is seeing more and more precipitation. So we're in this, we're actually quite dark blue, our specific area. However, if we look at the, at the summer months, we are in this tan section, probably this first tan, not that crazy. Um, cause we do have the great lakes in this area, which helps us out immensely without the great lakes. We would definitely be looking more in the, uh, darker Brown region, which shows less and less precipitation. So our summer was quite dry this year. And, uh, this, these are, you know, these are global trends. Like this is a lot, most of North America depicted and, uh, closer to the equator, look at how dark these parts of Mexico are in the summer. So very drought-like conditions. I mean, uh, it's we have to touch on the West Coast here. I mean, this is exactly where these fires that are raging are occurring right now, right? These immense forests are so dry that it just takes a spark for them to become engulfed, right, in flames. So I like these two figures. It, it shows something very interesting and important, you know, because as we see, and, and this encapsulates why we call it uh, climate change versus global warming, is because we are s receiving, uh, you know, it's just more, it's much more dynamic than just the planet simply warming up. In the winter months, we are getting much more precipitation. In the summer months, we are much more drier. So this is changing the plant assemblages. This is changing the mammals and all the different animals across these landscapes. Um, it's interacting with us in, in a very dynamic way. Um, so I'm glad that we changed the terminology to um, climate change because there is this seasonal aspect as well. So what consequences do we see? Well, it's warmer now than it has been in the last 2,000 years. Um, over the last century, the average global temperature has climbed about 0. 0.6 degrees Celsius. So that's around 1 degree Fahrenheit. Um, the global sea level has risen approximately 20 centimeters in the past century. Right? 20 centimeters. Take that 20 centimeters and multiply that by the surface area of our oceans, that is an incredible amount of water, right? Permafrost, which is allowing that sea, uh, that sea uh, level to increase, obviously permafrost is melting. You have houses, roads, pipelines, sewage systems, and transmission lines 
being damaged as the ground sinks beneath them as the water table rises. Um, Arctic sea ice has taken a huge hit. Um, it is only half as thick as it was 30 years ago. Half as thick 30 years ago, which is wild. Absolutely crazy. And I'm going to have some videos I want you to watch um, in the next few slides. Here's a top-down view of the North Pole. This data was collected in 2012. And since then, um, you know, eight years past, this area has, is even smaller, right? I mean, this is, you know, almost in 1980, 1979, you know, What's interesting is that there was very difficult, especially in the colder months of this region, um, you could not trade. You could not move cargo ships across Siberia to Alaska and Canada. Um, but nowadays, right, I mean, this is a, a benefit to the shipping industry. You know, parts of Russia can be easily connected to North America by traversing this very short distance, right? And, you know, in the future, you know, Russia can even go the opposite way to Greenland and Europe, um, which is just wild, right? I mean, the ice, I mean, that is irrefutable evidence. I have this video, I'll put this link below. It shows the seasonality of these uh, these sea ice changes, and it is very alarming. I'm not trying to scare you guys, but I have to tell you how it is and what's going on, and sea ice is melting so fast, and during the colder months of the year, it's just not replenishing like it once used to. Um, so in addition to this, we have nearly all mountain glaciers are retreating rapidly and many um, have disappeared entirely. So there is a large area along uh, around our terrestrial planet um, that maintains or has historically maintained dense ice sheets. Now these are high elevation regions, these alpine regions, but now, even these high mountainous alpine regions, they too are um, diminishing greatly. And satellite images and surface measurements show that the growing season are now as much as three weeks longer in a band across Eurasia and North America than they were 30 years ago. So what exactly do I mean growing season? Well, at our latitude, we do not grow plants, um, especially many of the uh, C4 grasses throughout the entire year. So your oatmeal that you eat, your grains that you eat, they are uh, going to be grown, many of them in the summer months. Um, now there is specific wheat that you do grow um, in the in some of the colder months um, but the growing season is that active uh, period of the year where plants uh, put on biomass and produce uh, you know the materials that we utilize so the growing season is actually three weeks longer um, so as the global temperature increases the growing season actually is becoming longer. So you, you might think, hey, we're, we're going to be growing more food, which is really good. However, that's not necessarily the case. So the growing season is longer, but the area of which we can grow these plants is becoming much smaller. And not only its size, not only the surface area that you see, you can see um, as our planet warms, uh, specific plant assemblages are going to migrate north where it is cooler, where there is more precipitation. So that's why we see this projection, this area for viable wheat in 2050. Yes, 
So the the uh, the season's going to be longer, but the area is going to be smaller. And something that is so important that I want us to realize is that the wheat um, that we see here that we're going to have to grow in 2050, um, number one, this is terrible for the U.S. economy, right? Look at that. No more wheat. Uh, we'll have to switch crops. We'll have to come up with something else or develop, you know, a system of indoor greenhouses, um, to produce wheat. So this is terrible for the U.S. economy. Secondly, and very importantly, is that these this land that you see here has not been used for agricultural purposes. These are dense forests, right? So this isn't an area that is, you know, uh, maintained by farmers. These are boreal forests dominated by different pine trees and different coniferous trees. Right. So the uh, in, you know, and we're already in 2020. So you're going to tell me in 2030, we're going to have to clear these lands, deforest these lands, make viable soils for us to plant wheat like it's just not economically viable. This is a this is very bad news and we are going to have to adapt super fast in the future, even though we have a longer growing season. This spells disaster. So here's evidence of those alpine glaciers retreating. You know, um, some of these alpine glaciers have been frozen for thousands of years. You get high enough in elevation, there's cold enough temperatures to maintain those, those frozen uh, reserves of water up in those mountains. Nowadays, we have this albedo, right? Light, the reflectivity of a surface. The evidence is uh, right in front of us as the planet warms, ice melts, even these alpine, um, these alpine regions. You have that dark uh, rock that absorbs more heat. You get more and more melting. You get more water flowing out. And then in the winter months, um, there just isn't that much recharge of these glaciers. I really, really, tr absolutely love this GIF of Africa, the satellite imagery literally showing this band of photosynthesis throughout the year. Um, this highlights the tilt of the earth and how the earth's uh, seasonality is across the equator. Um, it highlights a the largest non-polar desert on the planet. Look at how huge this area is. I mean, the United States of America can fit in the Sahara Desert. Um, for you, for you guys that might not know how large the continent of Africa is, absolutely massive. Um, another thing I really love to see is the Nile River here. The seasonal flooding of the Nile River and you get that, you know, during the drier months you see the dark green fade away into light green, but then you have that recharge, the flooding, especially in this flood plain where ancient uh, Egyptians grew most of their crops. Um, what a wonderful area to live in. I mean, when it comes to this huge Sahara Desert. I mean, this is a, a refuge, a uh, refugia for these ancient, um, for these ancient civilizations. I absolutely love that. And I just wanted to mention how important um, it is to realize these seasonal shifts. So as you can see, this band of plants that grow shift throughout the year. And this is why we have so many of these migratory animals, these different different un ungulates, um, even-toed ungulates. And Africa is the one of the last places on Earth that has megafauna, huge animals, right? And it's because of this seasonality that you have all these migrations. Um, within these different herbivores. Um, and you have these large predators 
um, changing their position following their uh, the animals that they eat. So I absolutely love this GIF. Um, last lecture I mentioned this tiny band of um, northern African forests um, and obviously there is another desert over here. Um, absolutely love this GIF. So like I previously mentioned there's more and more fires as droughts ensue these forests are drier so it takes less uh, heat energy um, for uh, fire to start so the frequency of fire is becoming uh, more intense as well as uh, the actual intensity of these fires um, so you can see fires on US service forest service land has increased actually looks like it's increasing at an increasing rate which is quite alarming Again, we have a, a unit dedicated to forest management and forest fires, but we should note that fires are a natural occurrence. However, um, because of our own management practices, what we're seeing across Oregon right now in parts of British Columbia are these massive um, crown fires. So these are very intense. Usually, um, you know, in a more natural ecosystem, um, you do get natural fires that swing through. Um, and it's super healthy, actually, for surface fires um, to ensue and kind of kill maybe um, some juvenile plants. And it allows, um, it just kind of balances the ecosystem a bit. When you get these, uh, these crown fires, you get the sterilization of the actual forest. It takes much longer for the forest to rebound. Um, and again, we're gonna get into that in its own unit, but just wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, some more evidence. Plants and animals are breeding earlier or extending their range into new territory. Um, I think it might be next lecture, the lecture after that, we're gonna talk about uh, bleaching uh, which is coral bleaching um, so we'll actually get into that but I like this figure a lot um, so each one of these colors is a different marine species um, you have lobsters over here you have stingrays over here um, different types of fish and you can see these arrows depict their migration right so as these as as the global climate warms up you have different patterns in the um in the oceans you have algal blooms that have moved positions so these animals um we know historically where they you know used to uh, live and these arrows depict that they actually are moving. So depending on which species um, You're going to move in a different direction to uh, get a better uh, You know find a more optimal Habitat now this is quite alarming because you can see right here these two organisms are moving towards each other and they are going to compete for uh, you know the same resources um, so the movement of these organisms actually has very large um, ecological implications. Um, and remember, quick reminder that this is an example of interspecific uh, competition, right? Interspecific competition. So how do we know that the climate is changing faster than usual? I mean, in Unit 2, we talked about all these extinction events, and you should realize that extinction events happened um, without humans, right? Um, but there is a ton of pivotal evidence that we are increasing CO2, and this comes from um, these atmospheric observatories, and we're going to learn about one specific observatory in Mauna Loa, which is actually a volcano um, in Hawaii. So the measurements uh, from not only this um, climate observatory 
uh, or atmospheric observatory, but many atmospheric observ observatories from around the world. It truly is um, irrefutable evidence. Um, these measurements show that the CO2 levels are increasing about 0.5% a year since 1958, and we call this the Keeling Curve. Um, and the Keeling Curve is this graph that I'm going to show you next that shows that CO2 concentrations have risen from 315 parts per million um, to 393 parts per million in 2012. We have surpassed that now. We are in the 400s, looking at around 415-ish. Um, so there is that irrefutable evidence. Here's what the Keeling curve looks like. Um, as you can see, carbon dioxide as a function of year, and we also have the temperature, um, which is this blue line um, showing that each, you know, the, the trajectory of the temperature is also increasing um, using these five-year means. Um, so, really cool graph. I'm going to get into that more um, right after I talk about Mauna Loa. So why is this such a great place to sample? Um, as you know from the other lectures, volcanoes release a ton of CO2. So why would you put a climate or an at atmospheric observatory at the base of a volcano? So out in the middle of the ocean, large quantities of uh, greenhouse gases are going to be thoroughly mixed, right? Um, so additionally, the uh, Mauna Loa is 3,000, almost 14,000, did I say 3,000? Almost 14,000 feet up in the air. So it, it can readily access these well-mixed um, uh, um, atmospheric gases um, and we know that the um, atmosphere that's being tested at Mauna Loa is not influenced by um, anthropogenic processes like basically there's a reason why there isn't a um, atmospheric um, observatory right outside of Shanghai right an industrial powerhouse right because obviously cities have a ton of greenhouse gas emissions so you're not going to want to skew your data by having an observatory in a really populated city Mauna Loa is out in the middle of the ocean and it has this high elevation so it's getting well mixed um, gases now it's still a volcano but if we look at it, the position of this Mauna Loa Observatory, um, these prevailing winds actually push the CO2 from the volcano out and away from Mauna Loa. Um, with Mauna Loa and the other um, data collected from around the world, we come up with this figure. And this figure I really want to talk about. Yes we clearly know the trajectory is increasing, right? But why the oscillation? Why this zigzag? And this is a great question. This is a question I commonly ask on tests and quizzes. Um, why the oscillation? Why um, is there in each year there is a high point and a low point of CO2. In one year, there's a high point and a low point. No matter where you are on the planet, there is a high point and a low point in any given year. This is because of seasonality. Seasonality. Remember that gif of Africa, the changing plant assemblages. Remember the late Devonian, right? plants absorb CO2. So during the growing season, when plants are absorbing CO2, they take CO2 out of the air, and guess what? 
that's when you have the valleys of the graph, right? These are the late spring into summer months where plants are absorbing most of the CO2, right? The peaks of, the, of this figure are the colder, um, non-growing winter months where plants are, most plants are completely dormant, right? So that is this yearly seasonality, which clearly is shown by this oscillation. Now you will notice that the uh, intensity of this oscillation does change with the um, area that the data, that the climate data was collected. Barrow, Alaska is this extremely northern place, yet it has this insanely heavy oscillation. Why is that? Well, Barrow, Alaska, although it might seem like a barren wasteland of ice, actually this ice melts and in the late spring there is booming plant communities, right? And because of that, you get a huge amount of sequestration of CO2, right? So people don't think that, you know, there's this growing season in Alaska, but plants um, in these northern regions, they go dormant throughout these really frigid cold months, but as soon as that season shifts, um, you get booming plant assemblages. And with it being this north, you guys know because of the Earth's tilt, I mean, at the North Pole, there's parts of the year where the sun actually never sets. So in northern latitudes, um, during the growing season, you're going to have these times of the year where the sun only sets um, a few hours. And then the sun's just beaming on those plant assemblages. So that's another great reason why you have that heavy oscillation in Barrow, Alaska. The South Pole is this purple line. Why is it so little in the South Pole? Well, there's not a lot of plants in the South Pole. Um, there are, you know, there is algae in the waters around the South Pole, which does contribute to this oscillation. But another question is that compared to the other uh, parts, uh, the other locations, the South Pole actually has the opposite oscillation. So where the other places peak, the South Pole valleys, right? We have the three peaks and then the valley of the South Pole. And this is because it's in the Southern Hemisphere and it has the opposite, um, the opposite season, right? So we are heading, I mean, we're in fall right now. And um, so we're approaching uh, winter. The Southern Hemisphere is approaching summer, right? So that is why the peaks are actually the opposite. So now I'm going to shift into the, um, this climate change debate. And we're going to focus on, you know, these, the main arguments that I commonly see. Um, now, it, again, it might seem like a debate, but amongst the scientific community, this is not a debate. Um, so I like this figure here, which makes more sense to you guys. Um, regional environmental groups and community activists spending their limited operating budgets in a massive conspiracy with over 90% of scientists to create a worldwide hoax to crash the global economy. Who would want that? Who would want to crash the global economy? Right? Or do we have big oil companies trillions and trillions of dollars, a ton of power, literal nations 
spending their obscene profits to bribe anybody they can. There are scientists, so-called scientists, that do get paychecks from big oil companies, oil lobbyists, um, to kind of refute uh, the data of over 90% of uh, credible researchers um, to protect their profits and limit any future liability their pollution may cause, which makes more sense to you guys. Now, 97% of scientists agree. Now, those 3% of scientists that argue against those climate scientists, they do receive funding from oil, oil giants and they trade using sound evidence for the public limelight. So instead of, basically you're not famous if you're a scientist that says um, climate change is happening and humans are a main catalyst of that. You don't get any, um, you know, news, uh, no, no newspapers talking about you because that is what over 90%, 97% of scientists realize, right? Um, however, if you want a little bit of attention as a scientist, you can say uh, climate, you know, the climate change is a hoax and it's a natural process or something, and you're going to get all this attention. You're going to become famous. So people actually do that, uh, do this solely for attention seeking, um, unfortunately. Um, and another thing that kind of might change an uneducated person's um, perception of climate change is that, for example, when they have uh, when they have Bill Nye the science guy um, on Fox News um, debating about climate change, they also have one of these, um, I'll say it, idiots um, who's, you know, coming up with an argument against that. To the everyday person, it looks like 50-50, right? Bill Nye, even though he represents the 97% of scientists, he gets the same airtime as this knucklehead who's getting paid, who's rich, who's getting paid by oil, big oil, to come up with terrible arguments to refute um, this climate change, right? So I think that Bill Nye should get 97% of the airtime allocated to the argument, if you ask me, because he represents 97% of these scientists who actually use and understand good, irrefutable data. Now, with those 3%, so we actually we have went through... Those 3% of publications that refute climate change. And we went through the, those 3% and we actually found bias faulty results. These people, they fudged their data, right? They, they could not, and when they were asked to replicate their data, they could not. There isn't one sound published paper and please send me a link to something that's published from a uh, a journal that is accepted um, that refutes climate change please send it my way science is a self-correcting process um, it is a way for us to uh, develop hypotheses, and this is a shame finding these faulty results, just putting a bad name into science, right? So do you guys think uh, capital gain, um, making more money outweighs a biological future? I strongly think that money is not the end-all be-all. Um, 
So why are there disputes over climate evidence? Climate scientists offer the following responses to some of the claims in the popular media. So reducing climate change requires abandoning our current way of life, right? Men, this is an argument I always see. I don't want to, you know, abandon my current way of life. I don't want to sit in my living room um, without lights on or walk to work instead of driving a car, right? This is not the case, right? We, we do have, um, there is alternate current energy systems. Europe and China are showing, you know, this to be false, right? Um, comfortable lifestyles require a high CO2 output. Data also shows this is false. Natural changes such as solar variation can explain observed warming. No, it does not. So I talked about these different uh, sun cycles and the sun uh, energy reaching the tops of our atmosphere, shifting, having this 11 year cycle. Look, the global surface temperature has increased. Um, and yes, we see this increase kind of coinciding with here, but why doesn't it go back down uh, in the low point of this cycle, right? So we are continuously increasing the temperature regardless of this 11 year sun cycle. So here are some responses over those disputes. The climate has changed before, we know that. So this is nothing new. Today's CO2 level exceeds anything that Earth has seen in nearly a million years, right? Million years. Temperature changes are leveling off. True on short time frames, but over decades, these trends are clearly seen continu continuously increasing. We had cool temperatures and snowstorms last year, not heat and drought. Now, again, this is why we shifted it to climate change and not global warming. There are regional differences in temperatures and precipitations, and we can predict those using these climate models. Climate scientists don't know everything, and they have made errors and misstatements. Again, I always hear that one. Fraud in data collection is uh, unheard, incredible scientists. Right. If you use fraudulent data, you will lose tenure. You will be wiped off the face of the earth in, earth in the scientific community. You do not want to do that. Um, that is a huge no-no. To act now actually makes financial sense. Um, if we control emissions, later down the road, there will be a huge economic interactions uh, that will be beneficial. So a 2010 study um, by the Pew Trust estimates the cost of lost ecological services by uh, 2100. These costs included factors such as loss of agricultural productivity from drought, damage to infrastructure from flooding and storms, and loss of biological productivity, as well as heat uh, health costs from heat stress and the loss of water supplies. Um, this report found that climate change is likely to cost between five trillion and 90 trillion. So that is a huge difference depending on what actually ensues. I get that, but you're still in the trillion dollar mark, which is uh, a ridiculous amount of money um, so acting now will save us a lot of coin in the future. And there's many ways we can reduce greenhouse emissions. We can reduce our dependence on coal, which produces more CO2 per energy unit than any other fossil fuel. We literally need to get, we need to get rid of coal. I mean, I'll say it. Um, and there are people in charge of the country right now who don't want to, who want to continue using these abysmal forms of um, fossil fuels. We could institute fees for selling fossil fuels. These would help fossil fuel prices pr uh, 
represent their many hidden costs, right? So, hey, if we're going to use fossil fuels, why not get taxed because this uh, because we're using these, there's going to be trillions of dollars in the future um, that we are going to have to, um, you know, pay up. We can invest in new technologies and, and energy efficiency. We can institute emission trading by instituting a legal cap on emissions, then allowing companies to buy and sell shares of their total cap. Right. So this will encourage companies to envision greener solutions. If you have to pay taxes for releasing this many emissions, um, you're going to want to shift your facilities, um, which is good for everybody. Right. It's good for everybody. And, that, and there has been international protocols um, in 1992, the United Nations. Um, Earth Summit meeting in Rio de Janeiro set an objective for stabilizing greenhouse emissions. In Kyoto, Japan in 1997, 160 nations agreed to roll back CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide emission, uh, uh, emissions about 5% below the 1990 emission levels um, by 2012. Um, but China and India were exempted from the agreement and the U.S. never ratified this agreement. Um, more recent news, obviously you guys heard that the U.S. pulled out of the uh, Paris Agreement, which was uh, definitely a low blow to people that actually know the and understand um, what's going on in our planet. So that concludes um, this lecture. I wanted to talk about this climate argument. I wanted to uh, understand... Uh, start talking about the effects of climate change. Um, thank you for your attention, guys. I hope you all the best. Have a uh, good rest of your day and keep doing those homework assignments um, and I will catch you on the flip side.